Imagine, if you can, what the rest of the evening was like. How they crouched by the fire which blazed and leaped and made so much of itself in the little grate. How they removed the covers of the dishes and found rich, hot, savory soup, which was a meal in itself, and sandwiches and toast and muffins enough for both of them. The mug from the washstand was used as Becky's teacup, and the tea was so delicious that it was not necessary to pretend that it was anything else but tea. They were warm and full-fed and happy, and it was just like Sarah that, having found her strange good fortune real, she should give herself up to the enjoyment of it to the utmost. She had lived such a life of imaginings that she was quite equal to accepting any wonderful thing that happened, and almost to cease, in a short time, to find it bewildering. "'I don't know anyone in the world who could have done it,' she said. "'But there has been someone, and here we are, sitting by their fire, and—and and it's true. And whoever it is, wherever they are, I have a friend, Becky. Someone is my friend.' It cannot be denied that as they sat before the blazing fire, and ate the nourishing, comfortable food, they felt a kind of rapturous awe, and looked into each other's eyes with something like doubt. "'Do you think—' Becky faltered once, in a whisper. "'Do you think it could melt away, miss? Hadn't we better be quick?' And she hastily crammed her sandwich into her mouth. If it was only a dream, kitchen manners could be overlooked. "'No, it won't melt away,' said Sarah. "'I am eating this muffin, and I can taste it. You never really eat things in dreams. You only think you are going to eat them.' Besides, I keep giving myself pinches, and I touched a hot piece of coal just now on purpose." The sleepy comfort which at length almost overpowered them was a heavenly thing. It was the drowsiness of happy, well-fed childhood, and they sat in the fire-glow and luxuriated in it, until Sarah found herself turning to look at her transformed bed. There were even blankets enough to share with Becky. The narrow couch in the next attic, was more comfortable that night than its occupant had ever dreamed that it could be. As she went out of the room, Becky turned upon the threshold and looked about her with devouring eyes. "'If it ain't here in the morning, miss,' she said, "'it's been here to-night, anyways, and I shan't never forget it.' She looked at each particular thing, as if to commit it to memory. "'The fire was there,' pointing with her finger and the table was before it, and the lamp was there, and the light looked rosy red, and there was a satin cover on your bed, and a warm rug on the floor, and everything looked beautiful, and— She paused a second, and laid her hand on her stomach tenderly. There was a soup, and sandwiches, and muffins, there was. And, with this conviction a reality at least, she went away. Through the mysterious agency which works in schools and among servants, it was quite well known in the morning that Sarah Crewe was in horrible disgrace, that Ermengarde was under punishment, and that Becky would have been packed out of the house before breakfast, but that a scullery-maid could not be dispensed with at once. The servants knew that she was allowed to stay, because Miss Minchin could not easily find another creature helpless and humble enough to work like a bounden slave for so few shillings a week. The elder girls in the schoolroom knew that if Miss Minchin did not send Sarah away, it was for practical reasons of her own. "'She's growing so fast and learning such a lot, somehow,' said Jessie to Lavinia, "'that she will be giving classes soon, and Miss Minchin knows she will have to work for nothing. It was rather nasty of you, Lavie, to tell about her having fun in the garret. How did you find it out? I got it out of Lottie. She's such a baby she didn't know she was telling me. There was nothing nasty at all in speaking to Miss Minchin. I felt it my duty. She was being deceitful, and it's ridiculous that she should look so grand and be made so much of in her rags and tatters. What were they doing when Miss Minchin caught them? Pretending some silly thing. Ermengarde had taken up her hamper to share with Sarah and Becky. She never invites us to share things. Not that I care, but it's rather vulgar of her to share with servant girls in attics. I wonder Miss Minchin didn't turn Sarah out, even if she does want her for a teacher. If she was turned out, where would she go? inquired Jessie, a trifle anxiously. How do I know? snapped Lavinia. She'll look rather queer when she comes into the schoolroom this morning, I should think, after what's happened. 
She had no dinner yesterday, and she's not to have any today. Jessie was not as ill-natured as she was silly. She picked up her book with a little jerk. Well, I think it's horrid, she said. They've no right to starve her to death. When Sarah went into the kitchen that morning, the cook looked askance at her, and so did the housemaids, but she passed them hurriedly. She had, in fact, overslept herself a little, and as Becky had done the same, neither had had time to see the other, and each had come downstairs in haste. Sarah went into the scullery. Becky was violently scrubbing a kettle, and was actually gurgling a little song in her throat. She looked up with a wildly elated face. "'It was there when I wakened, miss. The blanket!' she whispered excitedly. "'It was as real as it was last night.' "'So was mine,' said Sarah. "'It is all there now, all of it. While I was dressing, I ate some of the cold things we left.' "'Oh, laws! Oh, laws!' Becky uttered the exclamation in a sort of rapturous groan, and ducked her head over her kettle just in time, as the cook came in from the kitchen. Miss Minchin had expected to see in Sarah, when she appeared in the schoolroom, very much what Lavinia had expected to see. Sarah had always been an annoying puzzle to her, because severity never made her cry or look frightened. When she was scolded she stood still and listened politely with a grave face. When she was punished she performed her extra tasks or went without her meals, making no complaint or outward sign of rebellion. The very fact that she never made an impudent answer seemed to Miss Minchin a kind of impudence in itself. But after yesterday's deprivation of meals, the violent scene of last night, the prospect of hunger to-day, she must surely have broken down. It would be strange indeed if she did not come downstairs with pale cheeks and red eyes and an unhappy, humbled face. Miss Minchin saw her for the first time when she entered the schoolroom to hear the little French class, its lessons, and superintend its exercise. And she came in with a springing step, color in her cheeks, and a smile hovering about the corners of her mouth. It was the most astonishing thing Miss Minchin had ever known. It gave her quite a shock. What was the child made of? What could such a thing mean? She called her at once to her desk. "'You do not look as if you realize that you are in disgrace,' she said. "'Are you absolutely hardened?' "'The truth is that when one is still a child, or even if one is grown up, and has been well fed, and has slept long and softly and warm, when one has gone to sleep in the midst of a fairy story, and has wakened to find it real, one cannot be unhappy, or even look as if one were, and one could not, if one tried, keep a glow of joy out of one's eyes. Miss Minchin was almost struck dumb by the look of Sarah's eyes when she lifted them, and made her perfectly respectful answer. "'I beg your pardon, Miss Minchin,' she said. "'I know that I am in disgrace.' "'Be good enough not to forget it, and look as if you had come into a fortune. It is an impertinence. And remember, you are to have no food to-day.' "'Yes, Miss Minchin,' Sarah answered but as she turned away her heart leaped with the memory of what yesterday had been. "'If the magic had not saved me just in time,' she thought, "'how horrible it would have been!' "'She can't be very hungry,' whispered Lavinia. "'Just look at her. Perhaps she is pretending she has had a good breakfast.' <laughs> with a spiteful laugh. "'She's different from other people,' said Jessie, watching Sarah with her class. "'Sometimes I'm a bit frightened of her.' "'Ridiculous thing!' ejaculated Lavinia. All through the day the light was in Sarah's face and the color in her cheek. The servants cast puzzled glances at her and whispered to each other, and Miss Amelia's small blue eyes wore an expression of bewilderment. What such an audacious look of well-being under Auguste's displeasure could mean she could not understand. It was, however, just like Sarah's singular obstinate way she was probably determined to brave the matter out. One thing Sarah had resolved upon, as she thought things over. The wonders which had happened must be kept a secret, if such a thing were possible. If Miss Minchin should choose to mount to the attic again, of course all would be discovered. But it did not seem likely that she would do so for some time at least, until she was led by suspicion. Ermengarde and Lottie would be watched with such strictness that they would not dare to steal out of their beds again. Ermengarde could be told the story and trusted to keep it secret. 
If Lottie made any discoveries, she could be bound to secrecy also. Perhaps the magic itself would help to hide its own marvels. But whatever happens, Sarah kept saying to herself all day, whatever happens, somewhere in the world there is a heavenly kind person who is my friend, my friend. If I never know who it is, if I never can even thank him, I shall never feel quite so lonely. Oh, the magic was good to me. If it was possible for weather to be worse than it had been the day before, it was worse this day. Wetter, muddier, colder. There were more errands to be done, the cook was more irritable, and, knowing that Sarah was in disgrace, she was more savage. But what does anything matter when one's magic has just proved itself one's friend? Sarah's supper of the night before had given her strength. She knew that she should sleep well and warmly, and, even though she had naturally begun to be hungry again before evening, she felt that she could bear it until breakfast-time on the following day, when her meals would surely be given to her again. It was quite late when she was at last allowed to go upstairs. She had been told to go into the schoolroom and study until ten o'clock, and she had become interested in her work and remained over her books later. When she reached the top flight of stairs and stood before the attic door, it must be confessed that her heart beat rather fast. "'Of course, it might all have been taken away,' she whispered, trying to be brave. "'It might only have been lent to me for just that one awful night. But it was lent to me. I had it. It was real.' She pushed the door open and went in. Once inside she gasped slightly, shut the door, and stood with her back against it, looking from side to side. The magic had been there again. It actually had, and it had done even more than before. The fire was blazing in lovely, leaping flames, more merrily than ever. A number of new things had been brought into the attic which so altered the look of it that if she had not been past doubting she would have rubbed her eyes. Upon the low table another supper stood, this time with cups and plates for Becky as well as herself. A piece of bright, heavy, strange embroidery covered the battered mantel and on it some ornaments had been placed. All the bare ugly things which could be covered with draperies had been concealed and made to look quite pretty. Some odd materials of rich colors had been fastened against the wall with fine, sharp tacks, so sharp that they could be pressed into the wood and plaster without hammering. Some brilliant fans were pinned up, and there were several large cushions, big and substantial enough to use as seats. A wooden box was covered with a rug, and some cushions lay on it, so that it wore the air of a sofa. Sarah slowly moved away from the door, and simply sat down and looked, and looked again. "'It is exactly like something fairy come true,' she said. "'There isn't the least difference. I feel as if I might wish for anything, diamonds or bags of gold, and they would appear. That wouldn't be any stranger than this. Is this my garret? Am I the same cold, ragged, damp Sarah?' And to think I used to pretend and pretend and wish there were fairies. The one thing I always wanted was to see a fairy story come true. I am living in a fairy story. I feel as if I might be a fairy myself, and able to turn things into anything else. She rose and knocked upon the wall for the prisoner in the next cell, and the prisoner came. When she entered she almost dropped in a heap upon the floor. For a few seconds she quite lost her breath. Oh, laws! She gasped. Oh, laws, miss! Just as she had done in the scullery. You see? said Sarah. On this night Becky sat on a cushion upon the hearth rug and had a cup and saucer of her own. When Sarah went to bed she found that she had a new thick mattress and big downy pillows. Her old mattress and pillow had been removed to Becky's bedstead, and, consequently, with these additions Becky had been supplied with unheard of comfort. "'Where does it all come from?' Becky broke forth once. "'Laws, who does it, miss?' "'Don't let us even ask,' said Sarah. "'If it were not that I want to say, oh, thank you, I would rather not know. It makes it more beautiful.' From that time life became more wonderful day by day. The fairy story continued. Almost every day something new was done. Some new comfort or ornament appeared each time Sarah opened the door at night until in a short time the attic was a beautiful little room, full of all sorts of odd and luxurious things. The ugly walls were gradually entirely covered with pictures and draperies, ingenious pieces of folding furniture appeared, a bookshelf was hung up and filled with books, new comforts and conveniences appeared one by one, 
until there seemed nothing left to be desired. When Sarah went downstairs in the morning, the remains of the supper were on the table, and when she returned to the attic in the evening, the magician had removed them and left another nice little meal. Miss Minchin was as harsh and insulting as ever, Miss Amelia as peevish, and the servants were as vulgar and rude. Sarah was sent on errands in all weathers, and scolded and driven hither and thither. She was scarcely allowed to speak to Ermengarde and Lottie. Lavinia sneered at the increasing shabbiness of her clothes, and the other little girl stared curiously at her when she appeared in the schoolroom. But what did it all matter while she was living in this wonderful, mysterious story? It was more romantic and delightful than anything she had ever invented to comfort her starved young soul and save herself from despair. Sometimes, when she was scolded, she could scarcely keep from smiling. "'If only you knew,' she was saying to herself. "'If only you knew.' The comfort and happiness she enjoyed were making her stronger, and she had them always to look forward to. If she came home from her errands wet and tired and hungry, she knew she would soon be warm and well-fed after she had climbed the stairs. During the hardest day she could occupy herself blissfully by thinking of what she would see when she opened the attic door, and wondering what new delight had been prepared for her. In a very short time she began to look less thin. Color came into her cheeks, and her eyes did not seem so much too big for her face. "'Sarah Crewe looks wonderfully well,' Miss Minchin remarked disapprovingly to her sister. "'Yes,' answered poor, silly Miss Amelia. "'She is absolutely fattening. She was beginning to look like a little starved crow.' "'Starved?' exclaimed Miss Minchin angrily. "'There was no reason why she should look starved. She always had plenty to eat.' "'Of, of course,' agreed Miss Amelia, humbly, alarmed to find that she had, as usual, said the wrong thing. "'There is something very disagreeable in seeing that sort of thing in a child of her age,' said Miss Minchin, with haughty vagueness. "'What sort of thing?' Miss Amelia ventured. "'It might almost be called defiance,' answered Miss Minchin, feeling annoyed because she knew the thing she resented was nothing like defiance, and she did not know what other unpleasant term to use. The spirit and will of any other child would have been entirely humbled and broken by, by the changes she has had to submit to. But upon my word, she seems as little subdued as if, as if she were a princess. Do you remember, put in the unwise Miss Amelia, what she said to you that day in the schoolroom about what you would do if you found out that she was— No, I don't, said Miss Minchin. Don't talk nonsense but she remembered very clearly indeed. Very naturally, even Becky was beginning to look plumper and less frightened. She could not help it. She had her share in the secret fairy story, too. She had two mattresses, two pillows, plenty of bed-covering, and every night a hot supper and a seat on the cushions by the fire. The Bastille had melted away. The prisoners no longer existed. Two comforted children sat in the midst of delights. Sometimes Sarah read aloud from her books, sometimes she learned her own lessons, sometimes she sat and looked into the fire and tried to imagine who her friend could be, and wished she could say to him some of the things in her heart. Then it came about that another wonderful thing happened. A man came to the door and left several parcels. All were addressed in large letters, to the little girl in the right-hand attic. Sarah herself was sent to open the door and took them in. She laid the two largest parcels on the hall table, and was looking at the address, when Miss Minchin came down the stairs and saw her. "'Take the things to the young lady to whom they belong,' she said severely. "'Don't stand there staring at them.' "'They belong to me,' answered Sarah, quietly. "'To you?' exclaimed Miss Minchin. "'What do you mean?' "'I don't know where they came from,' said Sarah. "'But they are addressed to me. I sleep in the right-hand attic. Becky has the other one.' Miss Minchin came to her side and looked at the parcels with an excited expression. "'What is in them?' she demanded. "'I don't know,' replied Sarah. "'Open them,' she ordered. Sarah did as she was told. When the packages were unfolded, Miss Minchin's countenance wore suddenly a singular expression. What she saw was pretty and comfortable clothing—clothing clothing of different kinds. 
shoes, stockings, and gloves, and a warm and beautiful coat. There were even a nice hat and an umbrella. They were all good and expensive things, and on the pocket of the coat was pinned a paper, on which were written these words, To be worn every day, will be replaced by others when necessary. Miss Minchin was quite agitated. This was an incident which suggested strange things to her sordid mind. Could it be that she had made a mistake after all, and that the neglected child had some powerful though eccentric friend in the background? Perhaps some previously unknown relation, who had suddenly traced her whereabouts, and chose to provide for her in this mysterious and fantastic way? Relations were sometimes very odd, particularly rich old bachelor uncles, who did not care for having children near them. A man of that sort might prefer to overlook his young relation's welfare at a distance. Such a person, however, would be sure to be crotchety and hot-tempered enough to be easily offended. It would not be very pleasant if there were such a one, and he should learn all the truth about the thin, shabby clothes, the scant food, and the hard work. She felt very queer indeed, and very uncertain, and she gave a side glance at Sarah. Well she said, in a voice such as she had never used since the little girl lost her father. "'Someone is very kind to you. As the things have been sent, and you are to have new ones when they are worn out, you may as well go and put them on, and look respectable. After you are dressed you may come downstairs and learn your lessons in the schoolroom. You need not go out on any more errands to-day.' About half an hour afterward, when the schoolroom door opened and Sarah walked in, the entire seminary was struck dumb with amazement. "'My word!' ejaculated Jessie, jogging Lavinia's elbow. "'Look at the Princess Sarah!' Everybody was looking, and when Lavinia looked she turned quite red. It was the Princess Sarah indeed. At least, since the days when she had been a princess, Sarah had never looked as she did now. She did not seem the Sarah they had seen come down the back stairs a few hours ago. She was dressed in the kind of frock Lavinia had been used to envying her the possession of. It was deep and warm in color, and beautifully made. Her slender feet looked as they had done when Jessie had admired them, and the hair, whose heavy locks had made her look rather like a Shetland pony when it fell loose about her small, odd face, was tied back in a ribbon. "'Perhaps someone has left her a fortune,' Jessie whispered. "'I always thought something would happen to her.' She's so queer. Perhaps the diamond mines have suddenly appeared again, said Lavinia, scathingly. Don't please her by staring at her in that way, you silly thing. Sarah, broke in Miss Minchin's deep voice, come and sit here. And while the whole schoolroom stared and pushed with elbows, and scarcely made any effort to conceal its excited curiosity, Sarah went to her old seat of honor and bent her head over her books. That night, when she went to her room, after she and Becky had eaten their supper, she sat and looked at the fire seriously for a long time. "'Are you making something up in your head, miss?' Becky inquired with respectful softness. When Sarah sat in silence and looked into the coals with dreaming eyes, it generally meant that she was making a new story. But this time she was not, and she shook her head. "'No,' she answered. "'I am wondering what I ought to do.' Becky stared, still respectfully. She was filled with something approaching reverence for everything Sarah did and said. "'I can't help thinking about my friend,' Sarah explained. "'If he wants to keep himself a secret, it would be rude to try and find out who he is. But I do so want him to know how thankful I am to him, and how happy he has made me. Anyone who is kind wants to know when people have been made happy. They care for that more than for being thanked. I wish, I do wish.' She stopped short because her eyes at that instant fell upon something standing on a table in a corner. It was something she had found in the room when she came up to it only two days before. It was a little writing-case fitted with paper and envelopes and pens and ink. Oh! she exclaimed. Why did I not think of that before? She rose and went to the corner and brought the case back to the fire. I can write to him, she said joyfully. And leave it on the table. Then perhaps the person who takes the things away will take it, too. I won't ask him anything. He won't mind my thanking him, I feel sure." So she wrote a note. This is what she said. "'I hope you will not think it is impolite that I should write this note to you when you wish to keep yourself a secret. 
please believe i do not mean to be impolite or try to find out anything at all only i want to thank you for being so kind to me so heavenly kind and making everything like a fairy story i am so grateful to you and i am so happy and so is becky becky feels just as thankful as i do it is all just as beautiful and wonderful to her as it is to me we used to be so lonely and cold and hungry and now oh just think what you've done for us please let me say just these words it seems as if i ought to say them thank you thank you thank you the little girl in the attic the next morning she left this on the little table and in the evening it had been taken away with the other things so she knew the magician had received it and she was happier for the thought she was reading one of her new books to becky just before they went to their respective beds when her attention was attracted by a sound at the skylight when she looked up from her page she saw that becky had heard the sound also as she had turned her head to look and was listening rather nervously something's there miss she whispered yes said sarah slowly it sounds rather like a cat trying to get in she left her chair and went to the skylight it was a queer little sound she heard like a soft scratching she suddenly remembered something and laughed she remembered a quaint little intruder who had made his way into the attic once before she had seen him that very afternoon sitting disconsolately on a table before a window in the indian gentleman's house suppose she whispered in pleased excitement just suppose it was the monkey who had got away again oh i wish it was she climbed on a chair very cautiously raised the skylight and peeped out it had been snowing all day and on the snow quite near her crouched a tiny shivering figure whose small black face wrinkled itself piteously at the sight of her it is the monkey she cried out he has crept out of the last grass attic and he saw the light becky ran to her side are you going to let him in miss she said yes sarah answered joyfully it's too cold for monkeys to be out they're delicate i'll coax him in she put a hand out delicately speaking in a coaxing voice as she spoke to the sparrows and to melchizedek as if she were some friendly little animal herself and lovingly understood their timid wildness come along monkey darling she said i won't hurt you he knew she would not hurt him he knew it before she laid her soft caressing little paw on him and drew him toward her he had felt human love in the slim brown hands of ram das and he felt it in hers he let her lift him through the skylight and when he found himself in her arms he cuddled up to her breast and took friendly hold of a piece of her hair looking up into her face nice monkey nice monkey she crooned kissing his funny head oh i do love little animal things he was evidently glad to get to the fire and when she sat down and held him on her knee he looked from her to becky with mingled interest and appreciation he is plain looking miss ain't he said becky he looks like a very ugly baby laughed sarah i beg your pardon monkey but i'm glad you are not a baby your mother couldn't be proud of you and no one would dare to say you looked like any of your relations oh i do like you she leaned back in her chair and reflected perhaps he's sorry he's so ugly she said and it's always on his mind i wonder if he has a mind monkey my love have you a mind but the monkey only put up a tiny paw and scratched his head what shall you do with him becky asked i shall let him sleep with me tonight and then take him back to the indian gentleman tomorrow i am sorry to take you back monkey but you must go you ought to be fondest of your own family and i am not a real relation and when she went to bed she made him a nest at her feet and he curled up and slept there as if he were a baby and much pleased with his quarters The next afternoon three members of the large family sat in the Indian gentleman's library, doing their best to cheer him up. They had been allowed to come in to perform this office because he had specially invited them. He had been living in a state of suspense for some time, and today he was waiting for a certain event very anxiously. 
This event was the return of Mr. Carmichael from Moscow. His stay there had been prolonged from week to week. On his first arrival there, he had not been able satisfactorily to trace the family he had gone in search of. When he felt at last sure that he had found them, and had gone to their house, he had been told that they were absent on a journey. His efforts to reach them had been unavailing, so he had decided to remain in Moscow until their return. Mr. Carrisford sat in his reclining chair, and Janet sat on the floor beside him. He was very fond of Janet. Nora had found a footstool, and Donald was astride the tiger's head, which ornamented the rug made of the animal's skin. It must be owned that he was riding it rather violently. "'Don't cheer up so loud, Donna,' Janet said. "'When you come to cheer an ill person up, you don't cheer him up at the top of your voice. Perhaps cheering up is too loud, Mr. Carrisford,' turning to the Indian gentleman. But he only patted her shoulder. "'No, it isn't.' he answered and it keeps me from thinking too much i'm going to be quiet donald shouted we'll all be as quiet as mice mice don't make a noise like that said janet donald made a bridle of his handkerchief and bounced up and down on the tiger's head a whole lot of mice might he said cheerfully a thousand mice might i don't believe fifty thousand mice would said janet severely and we have to be as quiet as one mouse. Mr. Carrisford laughed and patted her shoulder again. Papa won't be very long now, she said. May we talk about the lost little girl? I don't think I could talk much about anything else just now. We like her so much, said Nora. We call her the little unfairy princess. Why? the Indian gentleman inquired. Because the fancies of the large family always made him forget things a little. It was Janet who answered. It is because, though she is not exactly a fairy, she will be so rich when she is found that she will be like a princess in a fairy tale. We called her the fairy princess at first, but it didn't quite suit. Is it true, said Nora, that her papa gave all his money to a friend to put in a mine that had diamonds in it, and then the friend thought he had lost it all, and ran away because he felt as if he was a robber? But he wasn't really, you know put in Janet hastily. The Indian gentleman took hold of her hand quickly. No, he wasn't really, he said. I am sorry for the friend, Janet said. I can't help it. He didn't mean to do it, and it would break his heart. I am sure it would break his heart. You are an understanding little woman, Janet, the Indian gentleman said, and he held her hand close. Did you tell Mr. Carrisford? Donald shouted again. About the little girl who isn't a beggar? Did you tell him she has new nice clothes? Perhaps she's been found by somebody when she was lost. There's a cat, exclaimed Janet. It's stopping before the door. It is Papa. They all ran to the windows to look out. Yes, it's Papa, Donald proclaimed. But there's no little girl. All three of them incontinently fled from the room and tumbled into the hall. It was in this way they always welcomed their father. They were to be heard jumping up and down, clapping their hands, and being caught up and kissed. Mr. Carrisford made an effort to rise, and sank back again into his chair. It is no use, he said. What a wreck I am. Mr. Carmichael's voice approached the door. No children, he was saying. You may come in after I have talked to Mr. Carrisford. Go and play with Ramdas. Then the door opened and he came in. He looked rosier than ever and brought an atmosphere of freshness and health with him. But his eyes were disappointed and anxious as they met the invalid's look of eager question, even as they grasped each other's hands. "'What news?' Mr. Carrisford asked. "'The child the Russian people adopted?' "'She's not the child we're looking for,' was Mr. Carmichael's answer. "'She is much younger than Captain Crewe's little girl. Her name is Emily Carew. I have seen and talked to her.' The Russians were able to give me every detail. How wearied and miserable the Indian gentleman looked. His hand dropped for Mr. Carmichael's. Then the search has to be begun over again, he said. That is all. Please sit down. Mr. Carmichael took a seat. Somehow he had gradually grown fond of this unhappy man. He was himself so well and happy, and so surrounded by cheerfulness and love, 
that desolation and broken health seemed pitifully unbearable things. If there had been the sound of just one gay little high-pitched voice in the house, it would have been so much less forlorn, and that a man should be compelled to carry about in his breast the thought that he had seemed to wrong and desert a child was not a thing one could face. Come, come, he said in his cheery voice. We've found her yet. We must begin at once. No time must be lost. Mr. Carrisford fretted. Have you any new suggestions to make? Any whatsoever? Mr. Carmichael felt rather restless, and he rose and began to pace the room with a thoughtful, though uncertain face. Well, perhaps, he said. I don't know what it may be worth. The fact is, an idea occurred to me as I was thinking the thing over in the train on the journey from Dover. What was it? If she is alive, she is somewhere. Yes, she is somewhere. We have searched the schools in Paris. Let us give up Paris and begin in London. That was my idea, to search London. There are schools enough in London, said Mr. Carrisford. Then he slightly started, roused by a recollection. By the way, there is one next door. Then we will begin there. We cannot begin nearer than next door. No, said Carrisford. There is a child there who interests me, but she is not a pupil. And she is a little dark, forlorn creature, as unlike poor Crewe as a child could be. Perhaps the magic was a work again at that very moment, the beautiful magic. It really seemed as if it might be so. What was it that brought Ram Dass into the room, even as his master spoke, salaaming respectfully, but with a scarcely concealed touch of excitement in his dark, flashing eyes? Sahib, he said, the child herself has come. The child the Sahib felt pity for. She brings back the monkey who had again run away to her attic under the roof. I have asked that she remain. It was my thought that it would please the Sahib to see and speak with her. Who is she? inquired Mr. Carmichael. God knows, Mr. Carrisford answered. She is the child I spoke of, a little drudge at the school. He waved his hand to Ram Dass and addressed him. Yes, I should like to see her. Go and bring her in. Then he turned to Mr. Carmichael. While you have been away, he explained, I have been desperate. The days were so dark and long. Ram Dass told me of this child's miseries, and together we invented a romantic plan to help her. I suppose it was a childish thing to do, but it gave me something to plan and think of. Without the help of an agile, soft-footed Oriental like Ram Dass, however, it could not have been done. Then Sarah came into the room. She carried the monkey in her arms, and he evidently did not intend to part from her if it could be helped. He was clinging to her and chattering, and the interesting excitement of finding herself in the Indian gentleman's room had brought a flush to Sarah's cheeks. "'Your monkey ran away again,' she said in her pretty voice. "'He came to my garret window last night, and I took him in because it was so cold. I would have brought him back if it had not been so late. I knew you were ill and might not like to be disturbed.' The Indian gentleman's hollow eyes dwelt on her with curious interest. "'That was very thoughtful of you,' he said. Sarah looked toward Ram Dass, who stood near the door. "'Shall I give him to the Lascar?' she asked. "'How do you know he is a Lascar?' said the Indian gentleman, smiling a little. "'Oh, I know Lascars,' Sarah said, handing over the reluctant monkey. "'I was born in India.' The Indian gentleman sat upright so suddenly, and with such a change of expression, that she was for a moment quite startled. "'You were born in India?' he exclaimed. "'Were you? Come here!' And he held out his hand. Sarah went to him and laid her hand in his, as he seemed to want to take it. She stood still, and her green-gray eyes met his wonderingly. Something seemed to be the matter with him. "'You live next door?' he demanded. Yes, I live next door at Miss Minchin's seminary. But you are not one of her pupils. A strange little smile hovered about Sarah's mouth. She hesitated a moment. I don't know exactly what I am, she replied. Why not? At first I was a pupil and a parlor boarder, but now... You were a pupil? What are you now? 
The queer little sad smile was on Sarah's lips again. I sleep in the attic next to the scullery maid, she said. I run errands for the cook. I do anything she tells me, and I teach the little ones their lessons. Question her, Carmichael, said Mr. Carrisford, sinking back as if he had lost his strength. Question her. I cannot. The big, kind father of the large family knew how to question little girls. Sarah realized how much practice he had had when he spoke to her in his nice, encouraging voice. What do you mean by at first, my child? He inquired. When I was first taken there by my papa. Where is your papa? He died, said Sarah, very quietly. He lost all his money and there was none left for me. There was no one to take care of me or to pay Miss Minchin. Carmichael! The Indian gentleman cried out loudly. Carmichael! We must not frighten her. Mr. Carmichael said aside to him in a quick, low voice, and he added aloud to Sarah, So you were sent up into the attic and made into a little drudge. That was about it, wasn't it? There was no one to take care of me, said Sarah. There was no money. I belonged to nobody. How did your father lose his money? The Indian gentleman broke in breathlessly. He did not lose it himself, Sarah answered, wondering still more each moment. He had a friend he was very fond of. He was very fond of him. It was his friend who took his money. He trusted his friend too much. The Indian gentleman's breath came more quickly. The friend might have meant to do no harm, he said. It might have happened through a mistake. Sarah did not know how unrelenting her quiet young voice sounded as she answered. If she had known, she would surely have tried to soften it for the Indian gentleman's sake. The suffering was just as bad for my papa, she said. It killed him. What was your father's name? The Indian gentleman said. Tell me. His name was Ralph Crew. Sarah answered, feeling startled. Captain Crew. He died in India. The haggard face contracted, and Ram Dass sprang to his master's side. Carmichael. The invalid gasped. It is the child. The child. For a moment Sarah thought he was going to die. Ram Dass poured out drops from a bottle and held them to his lips. Sarah stood near, trembling a little. She looked in a bewildered way at Mr. Carmichael. What child am I? She faltered. He was your father's friend. Mr. Carmichael answered her. Don't be frightened. We have been looking for you for two years. Sarah put her hand up to her forehead and her mouth trembled. She spoke as if she were in a dream. And I was at Miss Minchin's all the while, she half whispered, just on the other side of the wall. It was pretty comfortable Mrs. Carmichael who explained everything. She was sent for at once, and came across to the square to take Sarah into her warm arms and make clear to her all that had happened. The excitement of the totally unexpected discovery had been temporarily almost overpowering to Mr. Carrisford in his weak condition. "'Pon my word,' he said faintly to Mr. Carmichael, when it was suggested that the little girl should go into another room. I feel as if I do not want to lose sight of her. I will take care of her, Janet said, and Mamma will come in a few minutes. And it was Janet who led her away. We are so glad you are found, she said. You don't know how glad we are that you are found. Donald stood with his hands in his pockets and gazed at Sarah with reflecting and self-reproachful eyes. If I had just asked what your name was when I gave you my sixpence, he said, you would have told me it was Sarah Crew, and then you would have been found in a minute. Then Mrs. Carmichael came in. She looked very much moved, and suddenly took Sarah in her arms and kissed her. You look bewildered, poor child, she said, and it is not to be wondered at. Sarah could only think of one thing. Was he, she said with a glance toward the closed door of the library, was he the wicked friend? Oh, do tell me. Mrs. Carmichael was crying as she kissed her again. She felt as if she ought to be kissed very often because she had not been kissed for so long. 
He was not wicked, my dear, she answered. He did not really lose your papa's money. He only thought he had lost it, and because he loved him so much, his grief made him so ill that for a time he was not in his right mind. He almost died of brain fever, and long before he began to recover, your poor papa was dead. And he did not know where to find me, murmured Sarah. And I was so near. He believed you were in school in France, Mrs. Carmichael explained, and he was continually misled by false clues. He has looked for you everywhere. When he saw you pass by, looking so sad and neglected, he did not dream that you were his friend's poor child, but because you were a little girl too, he was sorry for you and wanted to make you happier and he told Ram Dass to climb into your attic window and try to make you comfortable. Sarah gave a start of joy. Her whole look changed. Did Ram Dass bring the things? She cried out. Did he tell Ram Dass to do it? Did he make the dream that came true? Yes, my dear. Yes, he is kind and good, and he was sorry for you, for little lost Sarah Cruz's sake. The library door opened, and Mr. Carmichael appeared, calling Sarah to him with a gesture. Mr. Carrisford is better already, he said. He wants you to come to him. Sarah did not wait. When the Indian gentleman looked at her as she entered, he saw that her face was all alight. She went and stood before his chair, with her hands clasped together against her breast. You sent the things to me, she said in a joyful, emotional little voice. The beautiful, beautiful things! You sent them! Yes, poor child, I did. He answered her. He was weak and broken with long illness and trouble, but he looked at her with a look she remembered in her father's eyes, that look of loving her and wanting to take her in his arms. It made her kneel down by him, just as she used to kneel by her father when they were the dearest friends and lovers in the world. Then it is you who are my friend, she said. It is you who are my friend. And she dropped her face on his thin hand and kissed it again and again. The man will be himself again in three weeks. Mr. Carmichael said aside to his wife. Look at his face already. In fact, he did look changed. Here was the little missus, and he had new things to think of and plan for already. In the first place there was Miss Minchin. She must be interviewed and told of the change which had taken place in the fortunes of her pupil. Sarah was not to return to the seminary at all. The Indian gentleman was very determined upon that point. She must remain where she was, and Mr. Carmichael should go and see Miss Minchin himself. I am glad I need not go back, said Sarah. She will be very angry. She does not like me, though perhaps it is my fault because I do not like her. But, oddly enough, Miss Minchin made it unnecessary for Mr. Carmichael to go to her, by actually coming in search of her pupil herself. She had wanted Sarah for something, and on inquiry had heard an astonishing thing. One of the housemaids had seen her steal out of the area with something hidden under her cloak, and had also seen her go up the steps of the next door and enter the house. "'What does she mean?' cried Miss Minchin to Miss Amelia. "'I don't know, I'm sure, sister,' answered Miss Amelia. "'Unless she has made friends with him because he has lived in India.' It would be just like her to thrust herself upon him, and try to gain his sympathies in some such impertinent fashion," said Miss Minchin. She must have been in the house two hours. I will not allow such presumption. I shall go and inquire into the matter, and apologize for her intrusion." Sarah was sitting on a footstool close to Mr. Carrisford's knee, and listening to some of the many things he felt it necessary to try to explain to her, when Ram Dass announced the visitor's arrival. Sarah rose involuntarily, and became rather pale, but Mr. Carrisford saw that she stood quietly, and showed none of the ordinary signs of child terror. Miss Minchin entered the room with a sternly dignified manner. She was correctly and well-dressed, and rigidly polite. "'I am sorry to disturb Mr. Carrisford,' she said, "'but I have explanations to make. I am Miss Minchin, the proprietress of the young ladies' seminary next door.' The Indian gentleman looked at her for a moment in silent scrutiny. He was a man who had naturally a rather hot temper, and he did not wish it to get too much the better of him. 
So you are Miss Minchin, he said. I am, sir. In that case, the Indian gentleman replied, you have arrived at the right time. My solicitor, Mr. Carmichael, was just on the point of going to see you. Mr. Carmichael bowed slightly, and Miss Minchin looked from him to Mr. Carisford in amazement. Your solicitor? She said. I do not understand. I have come here as a matter of duty. I have just discovered that you have been intruded upon through the forwardness of one of my pupils, a charity pupil. I came to explain that she intruded without my knowledge. She turned upon Sarah. Go home at once she commanded indignantly. "'You shall be severely punished. Go home at once.' The Indian gentleman drew Sarah to his side and patted her hand. "'She is not going.' Miss Minchin felt rather as if she must be losing her senses. "'Not going?' she repeated. "'No,' said Mr. Carisford. "'She is not going home, if you give your house that name. Her home for the future will be with me.' Miss Minchin fell back in amazed indignation. "'With you? With you, sir? What does this mean?' "'Kindly explain the matter, Carmichael,' said the Indian gentleman. "'And get it over as quickly as possible.' And he made Sarah sit down again, and held her hands in his, which was another trick of her papa's. Then Mr. Carmichael explained, in the quiet, level-toned, steady manner of a man who knew his subject, and all its legal significance, which was a thing Miss Minchin understood as a businesswoman, and did not enjoy. "'Mr. Carrisford, madam,' he said, "'was an intimate friend of the late Captain Crewe. He was his partner in certain large investments. The fortune which Captain Crewe supposed he had lost has been recovered and is now in Mr. Carrisford's hands.' "'The fortune?' cried Miss Minchin, and she really lost her colour as she uttered the exclamation. "'Sarah's fortune?' "'It will be Sarah's fortune,' replied Mr. Carmichael, rather coldly. "'It is Sarah's fortune now, in fact. Certain events have increased it enormously. The diamond mines have retrieved themselves.' "'The diamond mines?' Miss Minchin gasped out. If this was true, nothing so horrible, she felt, had ever happened to her since she was born. "'The diamond mines.' Mr. Carmichael repeated, and he could not help adding, with a rather sly, unlawyer-like smile, "'There are not many princesses, Miss Minchin, who are richer than your little charity pupil Sarah Crewe will be. Mr. Carrisford has been searching for her for nearly two years. He has found her at last, and he will keep her.' After which he asked Miss Minchin to sit down while he explained matters to her fully, and went into such details was necessary to make it quite clear to her that Sarah's future was an assured one, and that what had seemed to be lost was to be restored to her tenfold, also that she had in Mr. Carrisford a guardian as well as a friend. Miss Minchin was not a clever woman, and in her excitement she was silly enough to make one desperate effort to regain what she could not help seeing she had lost through her own worldly folly. "'He found her under my care,' she protested. "'I have done everything for her.' but for me she would have starved in the streets. Here the Indian gentleman lost his temper. As to starving in the streets, he said, she might have starved more comfortably there than in your attic. Captain Crewe left her in my charge, Miss Minchin argued. She must return to it until she is of age. She can be a parlour boarder again. She must finish her education. The law will interfere in my behalf. Come, come, Miss Minchin. Mr. Carmichael interposed. The law will do nothing of the sort. If Sarah herself wishes to return to you, I dare say Mr. Carrisford might not refuse to allow it. But that rests with Sarah. Then, said Miss Minchin, I appeal to Sarah. I have not spoiled you, perhaps, she said awkwardly to the little girl. But you know that your papa was pleased with your progress, and <clears throat> I have always been fond of you. Sarah's green-gray eyes fixed themselves on her with the quiet, clear look Miss Minchin particularly disliked. "'Have you, Miss Minchin?' she said. "'I did not know that.' Miss Minchin reddened and drew herself up. "'You ought to have known it,' said she. "'But children, unfortunately, never know what is best for them. Amelia and I always said you were the cleverest child in the school. Will you not do your duty to your poor papa and come home with me?' Sarah took a step toward her and stood still. 
She was thinking of the day when she had been told that she belonged to nobody, and was in danger of being turned into the street. She was thinking of the cold, hungry hours she had spent alone with Emily and Melchizedek in the attic. She looked Miss Minchin steadily in the face. "'You know why I will not go home with you, Miss Minchin,' she said. "'You know quite well.' A hot flush showed itself on Miss Minchin's hard, angry face. "'You will never see your companions again,' she began. "'I will see that Ermengarde and Lottie are kept away.' Mr. Carmichael stopped her with polite firmness. "'Excuse me,' he said. "'She will see anyone she wishes to see. The parents of Miss Crewe's fellow pupils are not likely to refuse her invitations to visit her at her guardian's house. Mr. Carrisford will attend to that.' It must be confessed that even Miss Minchin flinched. This was worse than the eccentric bachelor uncle who might have a peppery temper and be easily offended at the treatment of his niece. A woman of sordid mind could easily believe that most people would not refuse to allow their children to remain friends with a little heiress of diamond mines. And if Mr. Carrisford chose to tell certain of her patrons how unhappy Sarah Crewe had been made, many unpleasant things might happen. "'You have not undertaken an easy charge,' she said to the Indian gentleman as she turned to leave the room. "'You will discover that very soon. The child is neither truthful nor grateful. I suppose,' to Sarah, "'that you feel now that you are a princess again.' Sarah looked down and flushed a little, because she thought her pet fancy might not be easy for strangers, even nice ones, to understand at first. "'I—' "'I tried not to be anything else,' she answered in a low voice. "'Even when I was coldest and hungriest, I tried not to be.' "'Now it will not be necessary to try,' said Miss Minchin acidly, as Ram Dass salaamed her out of the room. She returned home and, going to her sitting-room, sent at once for Miss Amelia. She sat closeted with her all the rest of the afternoon, and it must be admitted that poor Miss Amelia passed through— more than one bad quarter of an hour. She shed a good many tears, and mopped her eyes a good deal. One of her unfortunate remarks almost caused her sister to snap her head entirely off, but it resulted in an unusual manner. "'I'm not as clever as you, sister, and I am always afraid to say things to you for fear of making you angry. Perhaps if I were not so timid it would be better for the school and for both of us. I must say I've often thought it would have been better if you had been less severe on Sarah Crewe, and had seen that she was decently dressed and more comfortable. I know she was worked too hard for a child of her age, and I know she was only half fed." "'How dare you say such a thing!' exclaimed Miss Minchin. "'I don't know how I dare,' Miss Amelia answered with a kind of reckless courage. "'But now I've begun I may as well finish, whatever happens to me. The child was a clever child and a good child, and she would have paid you for any kindness you had shown her. But you didn't show her any. The fact was she was too clever for you, and you always disliked her for that reason. She used to see through us both." "'Amelia!' gasped her infuriated elder, looking as if she would box her ears and knock her cap off, as she had often done to Becky. But Miss Amelia's disappointment had made her hysterical enough not to care what occurred next. She did, she did, she cried. She saw through us both. She saw that you were a hard-hearted worldly woman, and that I was a weak fool, and that we were both of us vulgar and mean enough to grovel on our knees before her money, and behave ill to her because it was taken from her, though she behaved herself like a little princess even when she was a beggar. She did, she did, like a little princess. And her hysterics got the better of the poor woman and she began to laugh and cry both at once, and rock herself backward and forward in such a way as made Miss Minchin stare aghast. "'And now you've lost her!' she cried wildly. "'And some other school will get her, and her money, and if she were like any other child she'd tell you how she's been treated, and all our pupils would be taken away and we should be ruined. And it serves us right, but it serves you right more than it does me. For you are a hard woman, Maria Minchin. You're a hard, selfish, worldly woman." And she was in danger of making so much noise with her hysterical chokes and gurgles 
that her sister was obliged to go to her, and apply salts and sal volatile to quiet her, instead of pouring forth her indignation at her audacity. And from that time forward, it may be mentioned, the elder Miss Minchin actually began to stand a little in awe of a sister who, while she looked so foolish, was evidently not quite so foolish as she looked, and might, consequently, break out and speak truths people did not want to hear. That evening, when the pupils were gathered together before the fire in the schoolroom, as was their custom before going to bed, Ermengarde came in with a letter in her hand, and a queer expression on her round face. It was queer because, while it was an expression of delighted excitement, it was combined with such amazement as seemed to belong to a kind of shock just received. "'What, what is, is the matter?' The matter? cried two or three voices at once. "'Is it anything to do with the row that has been going on?' said Lavinia, eagerly. "'There has been such a row in Miss Minchin's room. Miss Amelia has had something like hysterics and has had to go to bed.' Ermengarde answered them slowly, as if she were half stunned. "'I have just had this letter from Sarah,' she said, holding it out to let them see what a long letter it was. "'From, from Sarah. Sarah!' Every voice joined in that exclamation. "'Where is she?' almost shrieked Jessie. "'Next door,' said Ermengarde, still slowly. "'With the Indian gentleman.' "'Where? Where? Has she been sent away? Does Miss Minchin know? Was the row about that? Why did she write? Tell, tell us, us, tell us!' Tell us. There was a perfect babble, and Lottie began to cry plaintively. Ermengarde answered them slowly, as if she were half plunged out into what, at the moment, seemed the most important and self-explaining thing. "'There were diamond mines,' she said stoutly. "'There were!' Open mouths and open eyes confronted her. "'They were real,' she hurried on. "'It was all a mistake about them. Something happened for a time, and Mr. Carrisford thought they were ruined.' "'Who is Mr. Carrisford?' shouted Jessie. "'The Indian gentleman. And Captain Crewe thought so too, and he died. And Mr. Carrisford had brain fever and ran away, and he almost died. And he did not know where Sarah was. And it turned out that there were millions and millions of diamonds in the mines, and half and they belonged to her when she was living in the attic with no one but Melchizedek for a friend, and the cook ordering her about, and Mr. Carrisford found her this afternoon, and he has got her in his house, and she will never come back, and she will be more of a princess than she ever was, and a hundred and fifty thousand times more, and I am going to see her tomorrow afternoon, there. Even Miss Minchin herself could scarcely have controlled the uproar after this and though she heard the noise, she did not try. She was not in the mood to face anything more than she was facing in her room, while Miss Amelia was weeping in bed. She knew that the news had penetrated the walls in some mysterious manner, and that every servant and every child would go to bed talking about it. So until almost midnight the entire seminary, realizing somehow that all the rules were laid aside, crowded round Ermengarde in the schoolroom, and heard read and re-read the letter containing a story which was quite as wonderful as any Sarah herself had ever invented, and which had the amazing charm of having happened to Sarah herself and the mystic Indian gentleman in the very next house. Becky, who had heard it also, managed to creep upstairs earlier than usual. She wanted to get away from people and go and look at the little magic room once more. She did not know what would happen to it. It was not likely that it would be left to Miss Minchin. It would be taken away, and the attic would be bare and empty again. Glad as she was for Sarah's sake, she went up the last flight of stairs with a lump in her throat and tears blurring her sight. There would be no fire tonight, and no rosy lamp, no supper, and no princess sitting in the glow reading or telling stories. No princess. She choked down a sob as she pushed the attic door open, and then she broke into a low cry. The lamp was flushing the room, the fire was blazing, the supper was waiting, and Ram Dass was standing smiling into her startled face. Missy Sahib remembered, he said. She told the Sahib all. She wished you to know the good fortune which has befallen her. Behold, a letter on the tray. She has written. She did not wish that you should go to sleep unhappy. The Sahib commands you to come to him tomorrow. You are to be the attendant of Missy Sahib. Tonight I take these things back over the roof. And having said this with a beaming face, he made a little salaam and slipped through the skylight with an agile silentness of movement, 
which showed Becky how easily he had done it before. Never had such joy reigned in the nursery of the large family. Never had they dreamed of such delights as resulted from an intimate acquaintance with a little girl who was not a beggar. The mere fact of her sufferings and adventures made her a priceless possession. Everybody wanted to be told over and over again the things which had happened to her. When one was sitting by a warm fire in a big, glowing room, it was quite delightful to hear how cold it could be in an attic. It must be admitted that the attic was rather delighted in, and that its coldness and bareness quite sank into insignificance, when Melchizedek was remembered, and one heard about the sparrows and things one could see if one climbed on the table and stuck one's head and shoulders out of the skylight. Of course the thing loved best was the story of the banquet and the dream which was true. Sarah told it for the first time the day after she had been found. Several members of the large family came to take tea with her, and as they sat or curled up on the hearthrug, she told the story in her own way, and the Indian gentleman listened and watched her. When she had finished, she looked up at him and put her hand on his knee. "'That is my part,' she said. "'Now won't you tell me your part of it, Uncle Tom?' He had asked her to call him always Uncle Tom. "'I don't know your part yet, and it must be beautiful.' So he told them how, when he sat alone, ill and dull and irritable, Ram Dass had tried to distract him by describing the passers-by, and there was one child who passed oftener than any one else. He had begun to be interested in her, partly, perhaps, because he was thinking a great deal of a little girl, and partly because Ram Dass had been able to relate the incident of his visit to the attic in chase of the monkey. He had described its cheerless look, and the bearing of the child, who seemed as if she was not of the class of those who were treated as drudges and servants. Bit by bit, Ram Dass had made discoveries concerning the wretchedness of her life. He had found out how easy a matter it was to climb across the few yards of roof to the skylight, and this fact had been the beginning of all that followed. Sahib, he had said one day, I could cross the slates and make the child a fire when she is out on some errand. When she returned, wet and cold, to find it blazing, she would think a magician had done it. The idea had been so fanciful that Mr. Carrisford's sad face had lighted with a smile, and Ram Dass had been so filled with rapture that he had enlarged upon it and explained to his master how simple it would be to accomplish numbers of other things. He had shown a childlike pleasure and invention and the preparations for the carrying out of the plan had filled many a day with interest which would otherwise have dragged wearily. On the night of the frustrated banquet Ram Dass had kept watch, all his packages being in readiness in the attic which was his own, and the person who was to help him had waited with him, as interested as himself in the odd adventure. Ram Dass had been lying flat upon the slates, looking in at the skylight, when the banquet had come to its disastrous conclusion. He had been sure of the profoundness of Sarah's wearied sleep, and then, with a dark lantern, he had crept into the room while his companion had remained outside and handed the things to him. When Sarah had stirred ever so faintly, Ram Dass had closed the lantern slide and lain flat upon the floor. These and many other exciting things the children found out by asking a thousand questions. "'I am so glad,' Sarah said. I'm so glad it was you who were my friend. There never were such friends as these two became. Somehow they seemed to suit each other in a wonderful way. The Indian gentleman had never had a companion he liked quite as much as he liked Sarah. In a month's time he was, as Mr. Carmichael had prophesied he would be, a new man. He was always amused and interested, and he began to find an actual pleasure in the possession of the wealth that he had imagined that he loathed the burden of. There were so many charming things to plan for Sarah. There was a little joke between them that he was a magician, 
and it was one of his pleasures to invent things to surprise her. She found beautiful new flowers growing in her room, whimsical little gifts tucked under her pillows, and once, as they sat together in the evening, they heard the scratch of a heavy paw on the door, and when Sarah went to find out what it was, there stood a great dog, a splendid Russian boarhound, with a grand silver and gold collar bearing an inscription in raised letters. I am Boris, it read. I serve the Princess Sarah. There was nothing the Indian gentleman loved more than the recollection of the little princess in rags and tatters. The afternoons in which the large family, or Ermengarde and Lottie, gathered to rejoice there were very delightful. But the hours when Sarah and the Indian gentleman sat alone and read, or talked, had a special charm of their own. During their passing many interesting things occurred. One evening Mr. Carisford, looking up from his book, noticed that his companion had not stirred for some time, but sat gazing into the fire. "'What are you supposing, Sarah?' he asked. Sarah looked up with a bright color on her cheek. "'I was supposing,' she said. "'I was remembering that hungry day and a child I saw.' "'But there were a great many hungry days.' said the Indian gentleman, with a rather sad tone in his voice. "'Which hungry day was it?' "'I forgot you didn't know,' said Sarah. "'It was the day the dream came true.' Then she told him the story of the bun-shop, and the fourpence she picked up out of the sloppy mud, and the child who was hungrier than herself. She told it quite simply, in as few words as possible, but somehow the Indian gentleman found it necessary to shade his eyes with his hand and look down at the carpet. "'And I was supposing a kind of plan,' she said when she had finished. "'I was thinking I should like to do something.' "'What was it?' said Mr. Carisford in a low tone. "'You may do anything you like to do, Princess.' "'I was wondering,' rather hesitated Sarah. "'You know, you say I have so much money. I was wondering if I could go to see the bun woman and tell her that if, when hungry children particularly on those dreadful days, come and sit on the steps or look in at the window, she would just call them in and give them something to eat, and she might send the bills to me. Could I do that? You shall do it tomorrow morning, said the Indian gentleman. Thank you, said Sarah. You see, I know what it is to be hungry, and it's very hard when one cannot even pretend it away. Yes, yes, my dear, said the Indian gentleman. Yes, yes, it must be. Try to forget it. Come and sit on this footstool near my knee, and only remember, you are a princess. Yes, said Sarah, smiling. And I can give buns and bread to the populace. And she went and sat on the stool, and the Indian gentleman, he used to like her to call him that too sometimes, drew her small dark head down upon his knee and stroked her hair. The next morning Miss Minchin, in looking out of her window, saw the thing she perhaps least enjoyed seeing. The Indian gentleman's carriage, with its tall horses, drew up before the door of the next house, and its owner and a little figure, warm with soft, rich furs, descended the steps to get into it. The little figure was a familiar one, and reminded Miss Minchin of days in the past. It was followed by another as familiar, the sight of which she found very irritating. It was Becky, who— in the character of delighted attendant, always accompanied her young mistress to her carriage, carrying wraps and belongings. Already Becky had a pink, round face. A little later the carriage drew up before the door of the baker's shop, and its occupants got out, oddly enough, just as the bun-woman was putting a tray of smoking hot buns into the window. When Sarah entered the shop, the woman turned and looked at her, and, leaving the buns, came and stood behind the counter. For a moment she looked at Sarah very hard indeed, and then her good-natured face lighted up. "'I'm sure that I remember you, miss,' she said. "'And yet?' "'Yes,' said Sarah. "'Once you gave me six buns for fourpence, and—' "'And you gave five of them to a beggar child,' the woman broke in on her. "'I've always remembered it. I couldn't make it out at first. She turned round to the Indian gentleman and spoke her next words to him. I beg your pardon, sir, but there is not many young people that notices a hungry face in that way, and I've thought of it many a time. Excuse the liberty, miss, to Sarah, but you look rosier and, well, better than you did that, 
that. I am better, thank you, said Sarah. And I am much happier. And I have come to ask you to do something for me. Me, miss? exclaimed the bun woman, smiling cheerfully. Why, bless you. Yes, miss. What can I do? And then Sarah, leaning on the counter, made her little proposal concerning the dreadful days and the hungry waifs and the hot buns. The woman watched her and listened with an astonished face. Why, bless me, she said again when she had heard it all. It'll be a pleasure to me to do it. I'm a working woman myself and can't afford to do much on my own account, and there's sights of trouble on every side. But if you'll excuse me, I'm bound to say I've given away many a bit of bread since that wet afternoon, just at long of thinking of you, and how wet and cold you was and how hungry you looked. And yet you gave away your hot buns as if you were a princess. The Indian gentleman smiled involuntarily at this, and Sarah smiled a little too, remembering what she had said to herself when she put the buns down on the ravenous child's ragged lap. She looked so hungry, she said. She was even hungrier than I was. She was starving, said the woman. Many's the time she's told me of it since, how she sat there in the wet and felt as if a wolf was a-tearing at her poor young insides. Oh, have you seen her since, then? exclaimed Sarah. Do you know where she is? Yes, I do, answered the woman, smiling more good-naturedly than ever. Why, she's in that there back room, miss, and has been for a month. And a decent woman and girl she's going to turn out, and such a help to me in the shop and in the kitchen, as you'd scarce believe, knowing how she's lived. She stepped to the door of the little back parlor and spoke, and the next minute a girl came out and followed her behind the counter. And actually it was the beggar child, clean and neatly clothed, and looking as if she had not been hungry for a long time. She looked shy, but she had a nice face, now that she was no longer a savage, and the wild look had gone from her eyes. She knew Sarah in an instant, and stood and looked at her as if she could never look enough. "'You see,' said the woman, "'I told her to come when she was hungry, and when she'd come I'd give her odd jobs to do. And I found she was willing, and somehow got to like her. And the end of it was, I've given her a place and a home, and she helps me and behaves well, and is as thankful as a girl can be. Her name's Anne. She has no other. The children stood and looked at each other for a few minutes, and then Sarah took her hand out of her muff and held it out across the counter, and Anne took it, and they looked straight into each other's eyes. I am so glad, Sarah said. And I have just thought of something. Perhaps Mrs. Brown will let you be the one to give the buns and bread to the children. Perhaps you would like to do it because you know what it is to be hungry, too." "'Yes, miss,' said the girl. And somehow Sarah felt as if she understood her, though she said so little, and only stood still and looked and looked after her as she went out of the shop with the Indian gentleman, and they got into the carriage and drove away.